Welcome to 15 Minutes in the Book of Revelation. I'm Pastor Chester Hitchcock, and in this video we will be examining chapter 21 of the Book of Revelation. We only have this chapter and one more left. In the last chapter, we looked at the millennium and the thousand years that was spoken of in verses 2 through 7 of chapter 20, and like I said in that video, you will certainly get more from this lesson if you take time to read through the chapter first. So feel free to hit pause, read through the chapter, and then continue. But either way, be sure to have your Bible open to Revelation chapter 21 so that you'll be able to follow along as I comment about some of the points found in this chapter. The first eight verses of this chapter looks past the end of time as we know it into what lies beyond. And throughout the whole book of Revelation, we have been brought to this point time and again. At the end of the seals, at the end of the trumpets, at the end of the bowls, we were given glimpses of eternity. In this section, John describes a new world, and he does so in recognizable terms of a heaven and an earth, that gives us a picture of living not in some alien order of being, but certainly in a radically renewed situation. The first thing that grabs our attention is in verse 1 that it says, also there was no more sea. We need to be careful how we approach these kinds of statements. Does this mean that um, there will be no more beautiful sea creatures for us to enjoy in heaven or on the new earth? Does this mean that throughout eternity that we will never get to swim with the dolphins or enjoy the coral reefs? Various explanations have been offered to account for the omission of the sea among the scholars, but none claim this to be a literal description of the new earth. Instead, they range from suggesting that it is a result of the dread and fear of the sea of the ancient people is the reason that it was written that way, to even a mythological connection to the legend between the Babylonian gods of order and chaos that they were used to dealing with so much in their lives prior, to even possibly suggesting that in the mind of the writer, that is, in John's mind, that the sea is often symbolic of the depth of evil. For example, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, states that, it was out of the sea that the beast that blasphemed God made war with the saints had arisen. Now, regardless of what application scholars suggest, they all seem to reject the idea that the new earth will be without the beauty of oceans and seas and sea creatures. Verse 2, John declares that he not only sees a new heaven and a new earth, but also a new Jerusalem referred to as the Bride of Christ or the Lamb, in the same way that the people of God were presented as the Bride in chapter 19, verse 7. This is in stark contrast to the earthly city of Babylon as a harlot and the city of the New Jerusalem being a bride. George Beasley Murray, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, notes, quote, Revelation as a whole may be characterized as a tale of two cities, with a subtitle, The Harlot and the Bride. The New Jerusalem is presented as God's place of abiding presence. Again, in verse 5, God declares, Behold, I make all things new. And in the same verse, he tells John, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. In verses 6 through 8, the voice that comes from the throne continues declaring the finality of the old world polluted by sin and the beginning of a new way of life for the saints. The average reader generally expects the chapters to be the dividing points and markers in the book, but scholars see a couple of different ideas about when and where new scenes begin. Some see a new scene beginning at chapter 21, verse 9, and going through to chapter 22, verse 5. This scene is completely focused on the New Jerusalem as a bride. With chapter 22, verse 6 through the end of the chapter, an epilogue. Other scholars see a new scene beginning at chapter 21, verse 9, and running through 22, verse 19, combining the New Jerusalem and the New Earth. I see it encouraging that scholars can have 
varying opinions of such things because every time I read the book of Revelation, I learn something new. Every time I teach a seminar, I find something else to share that I didn't have in the last seminar. And this is so different from some Revelation seminars that I have attended years ago where a workbook was used over and over again every year, uh, teaching the same thing, never questioning a second look at any of the passages. Nevertheless, regardless of how scholars divide the section from here to the end, the scene begins with a brief but magnificent moving picture. Listen to verse 9, quote, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride and the wife of the Lamb. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Last Battle, writes, The things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful, I cannot write them. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of a great story with which no one on earth had read, which goes on forever and which every chapter is better than the one before, end quote. Verses 10 through 14 of chapter 21 in, in the Greek is one compound sentence that describes the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. It begins by telling of John being taken by the Spirit to a great and high mountain to watch the descent. Now in chapter 17 verse 1, when the Spirit took John to see the wicked city of Babylon, he wasn't taken to a mountain, but out into the wilderness. But in Jewish thought, mountains played a significant role. Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. Ezekiel on a mountain in Ezekiel chapter 40. Jesus' sermon on the mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. So here in Revelation chapter 21 verse 10, John is taken to a high mountain to witness the beauty of the marriage of the Lamb. The city glimmers and glistens with the beauty of the most precious stones. The walls are high with twelve gates and angels at each gate, and it's not that this city needs walls for protection and security, but walls give a picture of an ideal city as conceived by the ancient peoples, accustomed to security of strong walls. Robert Mounts, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, writes, Twelve gates symbolize abundant entrance. Reference to twelve tribes emphasizes the continuity of the New Testament church with God's people in the Old Testament times. Again, this demonstrates Revelation's focus is not simply on last day events beginning sometime in the future, but last day events that encompassed the last days that began at the expulsion of the Garden of Eden. Verses 15 through 17 of chapter 21 describe the measuring of the heavenly city. In chapter 11, John was told to measure the temple. There it was to symbolize perfection. Here in chapter 21, an angel does the measuring. That scholars suggest is for the purpose of portraying its beauty and its perfect symmetry. The average reader tends to want to know how long is a cubit? Or how many miles does the city take in? Or how crowded it might be if too many people are saved? Or how many angels can dance on the head of a needle? The Bible is a magnificent and indeed a holy piece of literature. The average reader can get from the holy book all that is necessary for salvation, but make no mistake. There is much more in this holy book than just about salvation, and God didn't produce it simply for us to be satisfied with the basics. He wants and even expects us to search and study to get to know him better. Because after all, God breathed these holy writings into such depth that that cannot be fully understood even by the most educated scholars of theology, where even they have varying opinions. However, this dichotomy provides two traps for Christians. 
The first is the thought that you have to be a trained theologian to understand Scripture. That is not true. I have always urged the average church member to read the Bible regularly, assuring them that God speaks to them when they do. But the second trap is equally tragic. And that is the thought that trained theologians really aren't that necessary. In every profession known to man, from medicine to carpentry, from law to plumbing, from electricians to accounting, we have learned to appreciate the experts. Those who have taken the time to learn the nuts and the bolts and the calculations and the measurements of their professions to make our lives better. Unfortunately, when it comes to our eternal lives, the things that help us to understand our Creator, Christians are often suspicious of pastors who have taken their calling seriously enough to get trained education, to take their church members deeper into the understanding of God's Word than they ever knew that they could go. Don't get me wrong, no professional should be given carte blanche when it comes to meeting our earthly needs, or even for meeting our spiritual needs. There are bad doctors out there that you can't trust. There are attorneys who abuse the laws of the land. There are carpenters who cut corners and cause roofs to fall in. There are electricians who mess up wiring and burn down houses. And the list goes on and on when it comes to negligence among professionals. But if we find a mechanic that we trust, if we find an accountant that we have confidence in, if we find an IT specialist that boosts our computer speed while moving the mouse at speeds that blow our minds, we tend to respect and learn from them things that we would not have never learned on our own. And we refer everyone to them that we meet. This should be true when it comes to the Bible as well. There are things in the Bible, both in the book of Revelation and other places, where many Christians have settled in on their particular opinion, and it doesn't seem to matter how well educated, or for that matter how trusted and respected a pastor is, some seem to close their minds of learning something if something new is presented that's different from what they believed in the past. Especially if the topic is something that they've held on to very firmly and have made opinions of their own and they don't want to admit that they've been wrong. Here in Revelation chapter 21, we have one of those examples. Here I will share with you some ideas about this passage that you most likely have not considered before. So here we go. Keep in mind, as we have noted throughout the series, numbers in the book of Revelation are to be understood in terms of quality, not quantity. And this is true here, as it is in every other place in the book of Revelation. Notice that verse 16 speaks of 12,000 furlongs, and verse 17 speaks of 144 cubits. Austin Farrer, in his commentary titled The Revelation of St. John, notes, as many others do, that the city is laid out in a cube. But he also points out that the cube has 12 edges. So that when the city is measured, the sum is 12 edges of 12,000 furlongs, which add up to 144,000, a symbolic number that we looked at previously that represents saints saved in the kingdom from the fall of mankind to the coming of Christ. Now, if you're not familiar with how the 144,000 represents the number of the saints from the fall to the second coming, Review my video on that topic that will be linked at the end of this video. Also, we noticed in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, that the people of God are referred to as the Bride of Christ. And this theme is found elsewhere in the Bible as well. So keep in mind, Christ didn't die for a city to be reconciled to him here on earth or in heaven. Christ died to reconcile mankind to himself. Christ is not joined in a relationship throughout eternity to a city, no matter how many streets are paved with gold. Christ is joined in a relationship throughout eternity to the people that he has redeemed. The city that comes down out of heaven is full of symbolism that describes God's people. Robert Mounts, in his commentary on Revelation, puts it this way, quote, 
this particular shape would immediately remind the Jewish readers of the inner sanctuary of the temple, parenthetically, a perfect cube, each dimension being 12 cubits, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 20, the place of divine presence, end quote. Do you see how this fits verse 3 of chapter 21? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. This symbolic picture of a city isn't describing the size and construction of a city with walls and gates that Christ is joined in a holy relationship with, but is describing the people of God descending with Christ with full protection and freedom as a mighty city. Mounts goes on to say, the significance of the measurement lies in the fact that it is a multiple of 12 and has to do with the people of God in their eternal sanctuary. Sadly for some, they are so hesitant to accept anything different to a passage that those who have spent their lives studying try to reveal from a professional level that they will continue to look at these verses trying to imagine, how's God going to fit all the saints inside? If one chooses to maintain the traditional understanding of this passage as describing a city, then verses 18 through 21 remains a visual picture of a literal city with walls of jasper and pure gold and clear glass with 12 foundations adorned with precious stones and 12 gates of pearl and all the streets paved with gold. For those who are willing to consider a different application where Christ is portrayed of being in love with his people rather than being in love with a city, no matter what kind of precious stones are there, then verses 18 through 21 describes the twelve patriarchs and the twelve apostles and all who follow Christ as precious jewels. Proverbs chapter 31 verses 10 through 31 describes the virtuous wife like a bride. Verse 10 says, Who can find a virtuous wife for she is worth far more than rubies. Far more than rubies? Would that also include jasper and sapphire and emeralds and beryl and topaz and amethyst that we find in verses 19 through 21 of chapter 21 of Revelation? Well, of course it would. So let's look at this again. Revelation 21 verse 12 tells us that the names of the patriarchs, the 12 patriarchs, are written on the 12 pearly gates. Revelation 21.14 tells us that the names of the twelve apostles are written on the twelve foundations, and that the measurements of the city sum up to 144,000, the symbolic number of the saints. The new Jerusalem bride prepared for the Lamb is not a city, but it's the saints. Many Christians have said for years that the church is not a building. The church is the people. This is such an awesome truth, but also a modern-day example of how God's people realize that brick and mortar does not make a church. People do. Verse 22 of Revelation chapter 21 says, quote, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. Remember, God is dwelling with us. He doesn't need a temple or sanctuary. He is in our midst. Verse 23 tells us that, quote, The city has no need for the sun or the moon, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. As we have noted in the past, the average reader tends to read things literal. And many refuse to read it any other way, no matter how much training and education the pastor has. But to consider the symbolism is much more captivating and awesome to imagine. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 through 24, describe this new creation this way. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain, it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come before me, says the Lord. Just because we don't need the sun or the moon, as Revelation 22, 23 says, doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. And I will cover this even more in the next video. Verse 27 closes a chapter like this. But there will by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This verse is not meant to be a threat to God's people who are in hand-to-hand -hand combat with sin. 
We all have problems in our lives that defile us and make us an abomination. It always pains me to see this verse used from the pulpit to frighten the saints into trying harder. It's not meant as a threat to the saints, but a promise. God is saying, I promise you, your battle with sin will be over. There will never again be an enemy to threaten you. In the next video, we'll examine the last chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Keep in mind, while we are examining them chapter by chapter, scholars show us where the real divisions and themes start and end, and it's not always at the chapters. Chapter 22 continues the topic that began in chapter 21, the New Jerusalem, the city that descends from heaven, that really isn't a city at all, but is a symbol of the saints redeemed by Christ, prepared for an eternal relationship with Christ. The church is not the building. The church is the people. The Lamb's Bride is not a city. The Lamb's Bride is the redeemed. And if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the series yet or to this channel yet, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so that you'll be sure to catch the next video when it comes up. God bless, and I'll see you in the next video.